Hi guys, it's time to talk about the 21st century. So let's start off when we say a word about cyberpunk. Um, so works by authors like William Gibson, Bruce Sterling, Neil Stevenson, films like Blade Runner, The Matrix, set up this context that is certainly not all of the 21st century, but is a rather significant context to a lot of what's happening. Um, we have a new art idea that's been introduced. Uh, Nicholas Boyard has created this concept of artistic practices that take as their point of departure the whole of human relations and social context rather than an independent private space. So interesting space that he's carved out of um, human relations, relational aesthetics. Here's a bunch of artists who are working in that space. Um, okay, we've got these various kinds of gatherings that take place. We have urban culture. Um, things like graffiti and street art. We have a book on that. So I, rather than take up time here, I will just leave that to our book. And similarly, uh, up here, internet art, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on in that topic, but I, I'm not gonna have time in this short video to, to dive in. So we have a book on internet art and I will leave our book to sort of introduce internet and cloud-based art. So I really wanna focus just on digital art. Um, or what I'm calling digital. I mean, obviously the difference between digital and internet isn't too huge, but um, I wanna focus on that. And let me say really quickly on the idea of neurobiology, that that's a pretty interesting space. So neuroaesthetics, a really interesting idea of, you know, on a wiring diagram level of the human brain, why we like some of the art that we like. And synesthesia, not simply the condition, which is pretty interesting in and of itself, but the idea of digital synesthesia, which opens up a new realm of possibilities for art, expression, visualization, and, and experience in other media. Okay, let's, for the few minutes available, let's think about these digital art works. And I don't even have time to talk about all of this. So I'm not going to talk about cyborgs, robotics, digital descent. Let me say simply gaming is huge. Okay, I'll repeat that. Gaming is huge. Um, let me talk about just these four things really. Generative art, data visualization, GPS, images that think. So generative art, pretty interesting idea. Um, if you think about sheet music, uh, sheet music is a set of instructions. If you hand it to a machine, i.e. a human being who reads sheet music, you can have a generated musical performance. Or even better yet, a player piano. If you punch holes in this player role and thread it in a piano, music comes out. Um, or in dance, lava notation. So, you know, different dancers might be more or less, um, you know, talented or inspired or whatever. But um, at least in principle, lava notation is going to give you potentially quite detailed notation of what that performance is. Or as let's say the artist Saul LeWitt, who has spent a career um, writing instructions for many different things, but for example, wall drawings. So a Saul LeWitt set of instructions says, take a wall, uh, divide it in half horizontally and vertically, draw an arc from here to here, now draw another arc from here to here, now paint this arc one color, now paint another color. And so, he doesn't necessarily make the painting himself. Maybe he never even is at the site, but a Solowit sheet of instructions um, generates a wall drawing. So dance, music, Solowit wall drawings, all these things are sets of instructions that generate works of art. Uh, but obviously now in digital space, you know, algorithms, code, we can write things that computers can make um, sort of anything, whether it's an animated film or an, uh, you know, an abstract mandala or many, many things. So idea that algorithms could be used to generate art, or if you want to project that forward a little bit, even just the idea of, in a way, the hashtag that we have today, right? Um, so what if I make a website that just gathers um, Instagrams or video clips that are hashtagged a certain way. So the whole website is built live, not by me typing words and saying publish, but by data being fed in by some hashtag or algorithmic element. So lots of different ways that art can be generative today. Data visualization. Um, you, you know, it's not really a new topic. I'm sure you see a visualization of something like every single day these days. So here's a photographer, kind of interesting, Chris Jordan. Um, he's made these huge photo prints of all kinds of aspects of our life. So for example, so this is the actual photo print. It's a huge wall piece. It's, you know, it's, I don't know, 10 feet long or something. Um, 
and here I'm just zooming in on the details, but he's taken all this data, like for example, the United States, one country, every five minutes, every five minutes, we use, we toss 2 million plastic bottle beverages. So the stat alone is pretty staggering. But to make it a little more staggering, he's made these gigantic prints. So from across the gallery, you see this ocean. And then as you walk closer, you see more and more of how we're impacting things. Um, so he's done a whole series of these. That are in, in one sense, they're very simple, but they're, you know, they're really impactful pieces. Um, or so are, you've probably played with Wordle. So, you know, this is the syllabus for our class uh, run into Wordle and, you know, uh, looked at by word frequency. Um, all kinds of visualizations, right? So here's a visualization of Iran's blogosphere, um, of Fortune 500 companies, of the Beatles recording activities, of, you know, religious texts. This is, I think, a, a, so a sort of a provocative visualization of someone went to, you know, dance clubs and, and surveyed alcohol and dancing and sex, whatever. And, and here's their sort of graphic visualization of that. Um, oh, looky, this thing we're looking at, kind of a visualization or a structure or an organization of relationships, I, I suppose. Um, lots of other uh, elements here. Okay, a little bit about GPS. So here's a nice photo, Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, and why? what's that on her arm but the GPS coordinates of where all her children were born. Um, here's Corey Mervis interesting project in 2004, the presidential year, she used GPS and a bus to write the word vote across the United States. She started in New York. She wound up at the Santa Monica Pier, which is actually where I ran into her. And as far as I know, it's the largest piece of art that I'm aware of. Um, it's also a piece of art that's hard to see because it's simply her bus. And if you don't have GPS to sort of put the track together of her long journey and she visited with people and did surveys along the way. So it's a whole kind of process that she created. Um, but in a sense, it can only be seen in data space. It was a very physical activity. It took her months. But it, in one sense, it only exists in data space because it's this GPS. She, you know, I think I forget what city it was. She had to drive through three times to do the T, to cross the T and vote. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of driving to write a gigantic word with GPS. Masaki Fujihara, really interesting piece he did. He created this whole amazing rig with GPS and XYZ compass and shotgun microphone and video. And so what he did was he took all these video interviews he did. I think it's like a French-German border. Um, but used all the data to be able to rectify the video streams in three-dimensional space. And then when you go experience this in the gallery, you have a trackball and you can move through all these windows of video um, sort of rectified in virtual space. So it's real world video, but now creating a, a 3D virtual space that you can navigate through. Um, okay, a little bit about GPS. Um, and let me say a bit about images that think. So this is a pretty interesting concept, I, I think. So painting, this guy's like 30,000 years old, right? All those caves we looked at. Photography, a whole lot younger, 180 years. But you know what's even younger? is the idea of thinking images. Um, so for almost all of photography's history, I made a print and the print had no agency of its own. I could take that print and stick it on my wall. I could hand it to you. I could put it in an envelope and take it to the post office. I could tear it up, but the, the only agency was mine. Uh, now suddenly photographs are beginning to have their own agency. Okay, so what's the history of thinking? We are thinking beings, right? Homo sapiens. Um, I think, therefore, I am. It's kind of the definition of what we are, uh, but now images can do it too. So if you think about, you know, I'm obviously skipping a lot of detail here, but um, photography has been an index of the true for us. Painting, I think we always understood as having some inspiration or, or variation by the, the hand and mind of the painter. But photographs, we have always kind of felt those were true. And so Lewis Hine, for example, his photography, the, the child labor was discussed for a long time and nothing happened. But when he went out and photographed children in factories, American labor laws changed. So the fact that we believe photographs to be true, to be factual, is hugely important. But, the, you know, there are all these stories where, you know, it's going to be more complicated than that. Um, 
Okay, so about these thinking images. So what are some ways that images think? Well, there's all kinds of little toys that people have played. So this is like Cool Iris is a search thing, uh, but it just gave you your, so Google image search, I think has kind of replaced this now, but it gave you this video wall of images you could flip through. Another one was um, Flickr, giving you this big gigantic Flickr result of images or Flickr vision. This is a cool globe that spins around showing you pictures as they're uploaded every second. Um, and so it's, you know, it's this, amazing snapshot of what the inhabitants of planet Earth are doing. Or here you can search by color or by multiple colors. So none of these images and none of these photographers ever imagined that they would be right next to each other, but in data space, sort of anything is possible. Um, or image search by structure and, and color. Um, Photosynth, really interesting piece of software that um, stitches together 3D models out of pieces. So in this case, I think I went to a volleyball game and uploaded a ton of photos, but they're all from my camera. Photosynth also has the ability to take images from different places, to go to a place like Flickr and download tens of thousands of images of Notre Dame Cathedral, for example, if you watch this video, click here, um, and create a 3D model based on literally thousands and thousands and thousands of different photographers' pieces all put together in ways that they never imagined. Gremlins, right? You're not supposed to feed them after midnight, otherwise they, uh, they take off and go crazy. Uh, photos, hopefully not in a crazy sense, but photos now are taking on a life of their own. Um, photos have metadata. If I put up a picture and I say, oh, look, here's a photo of two people. This one is called Glenn Zuckman. Oh, this one is called Eric Morales. Well, now that photo carries with it information. Maybe it also has lens data, focal length. Maybe it also has GPS data. Where on the earth was it taken? Maybe it also has XYZ compass data. What was the orientation of the camera when this uh, image was captured? And they can do things with that data. If you go to Notre Dame Cathedral, take a picture, and you label the saints on the facade of the cathedral, and I go and I don't label the saints, well, maybe, you know, maybe your photo and my photo go on a date, so to speak. And... Uh, they're able to line up a piece of the image to understand that it's the same place. And then the metadata from your photo of who those saints are goes over to my photo. So new combinations and possibilities possible. Um, scene completion. This is a pretty interesting uh, idea. So let's say you go on, you know, to the Greek islands or someplace and you take this perfect vacation photo, except there's, you know, a car in the middle of your shot or something. So you circle the part you don't want and you let this piece of software go out and download a million Flickr photos and find the missing parts of your image and create this new image. So technically that's pretty interesting. Cool vacation photo wise is pretty interesting, but conceptually I think it's even more interesting. Sort of where is the real? We could say, well, this original photo, what you actually snapped is real, and this modified photo that was never actually in front of your camera is fake. On the other hand, if I had a great vacation, you know, some image with a car or this big roof sticking into the thing, that's not really what I experienced. Technically, it's what I experienced, but emotionally, it isn't. I was having a great time. And this idyllic photo that never really existed is in some senses maybe more real or the fake is more real than the real or you know I don't, or maybe those words don't even mean anything anymore or maybe they never did mean anything but a lot of ideas to think about in these images that think okay this idea of Fourier space so in the past when you took a picture uh, you could focus it close or medium or far and then you snapped it and that was that today you can take a picture and you can focus it a week later pretty crazy um, so this idea of seam carving, when um, Ansel Adams spends a week to take a single frame of a picture, uh, Half Dome or Moonrise over Hernandez or something like that, you know, we think of these as incredible, perfect masterpieces. You should never touch a pixel of them or a grain of that image. Um, but, you know, that's kind of not the world that we live so much of our lives in. We have all kinds of devices, huge devices, giant screens, projectors, tiny devices, phones, tablets, laptops. Uh, some are vertical, some are horizontal. Things are different. So what do you do when an image is the wrong size? Do you, do you just say, well, I'm a great photographer. Don't touch my stuff? Or do we, or do we deal with the reality of it? Um, so I have a vertical image and I need it to be not vertical or square maybe. Um, well, I could either squeeze the whole thing, in which case her face would be squashed like a pancake and look ridiculous, or I could crop it randomly, in which case maybe I lose her head or maybe I lose this food on the table, 
or I could let an intelligent algorithm find the low energy function of the image and remove the middle and squash them together. And now I have all the cool food on the table. The baby looks great. The mom looks great. This is really conceptually, this is what I want the photo to be, even though it isn't. So is this photo a lie? Well, it is kind of, um, but it's functionally, it's a more responsive image for the way that we consume images today. So um, I, as usual, I'm going kind of long, so I, wanna, I need to wrap it up and stop already, but I think the idea of thinking images is a really powerful idea of our time and how we relate to these things that only a few years ago we were pretty sure was an index of the true, and now, you know, what is it that, that we're looking at?